Welcome, welcome to the first CSE Distinguished Lecture of the year 2009. Um, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Sebastian Thrun. Um, Sebastian is doing research in um, different areas spanning AI, machine learning, and robotics. And I think it's, it's safe to say that he is one of the most influential researchers in all these areas. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Bonn in Germany obviously a great place to get a PhD from. Um, he then became faculty at Carnegie Mellon University and after five years moved on to Stanford University where he is now director of the Stanford AI Lab. Um, I think Sebastian might be best known in a sense for his work in machine learning and robotics where he essentially started a new subfield called probabilistic robotics. The idea of that approach is that Robots should deal with the uncertainty about the world and the noise in their sensors simply by representing everything um, by random variables and then performing reasoning um, via estimating distributions over these random variables. He showed um, in several robot deployments that this um, actually results in very successful systems. He installed robots in uh, museums as tour guides. Um, he uh, put robots in a nursing home actually in hard coal mines in Pennsylvania and performed mapping in these mines. And most recently, um, he did work uh, with autonomous driving vehicles in the context of the DARPA Grand Challenge. He actually, his team won the DARPA Grand Challenge and was the first time to finish it successfully. And um, he got second place in the uh, DARPA Urban Challenge. Um, Sebastian received many, many honors for his work. I don't even wanna try to go through the list of his best paper awards. Uh, he's a fellow of AAAI, fellow of ICAI, which is a European AI community. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Um, he also spent just recently a year at Google. And I must say, I have no idea what he did there. Because that. He's not allowed to talk about that. But what I know that actually Sebastian is the person behind Street View. So whenever anybody of you has used Street View, that here's the person who actually made it work. And today he's gonna talk to us about how we can make cars drive themselves. Welcome, Sebastian. Thanks. Thanks, Dieter. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. From all the introductions I've ever received in my entire career, this is clearly the most recent. Um, <laughs> it's also great to be in UW, one of the top three computer science departments in the nation. Um, and it's great to see my former postdoc, Dieter, to be so loved and successful here. Um, Dieter invited me for quite a while to give a talk and I found the time and I'm delighted to be here uh, about my work uh, in the area of autonomous cars. And before I uh, dive into uh, technical detail, I want to give you a sense of why I'm working on this and why some of you should, should join me in working on this and, and do good work. So we've experienced in the last 15 years the advent of the internet as a major innovation in this nation. And if you ask what the internet did to us, it changed one technological dimension, which is the storage and transport of data, and thereby affected almost every aspect of human communication, from broadcast communication, television, radio, newspapers, printed uh, communication, books, all the way to private communication, email, and now things like Facebook. That's been one of the most profound revolution in technology ever. It far surpasses Gutenberg's revolution, in my opinion. And we are now in a time of even faster accelerated change uh, that, that we're gonna endure. The area of transportation, which cars fit into, unfortunately, hasn't undergone any transformation in the last 60 years. And today, we're lamenting the uh, disappearance of the American automotive industry. Oh, many say rightfully so for lack of innovation. That might be somewhat unfair. But the way we, we move about our environments uh, tends to be the same way we did it 50 years ago. Our grandparents would know how to use today's cars. Our grandparents don't know how to use Facebook. I think we are ready for a revolution in the area of transportation that could rival or parallel the revolution the internet has brought about, okay? And I kid you not, the transportation for most of us is the second biggest expense in our life, so it's actually more important than food or, or many other pursuit of, of, of human life. If you look at today's transportation sector in the United States, it is, in my opinion, uh, irresponsibly uneconomical and dangerous. We lose 42,000 people every year in traffic accidents. That's one September 11 every month. Just give you kind of a scope of size, okay? 
um, we uh, waste a lot of energy. It turns out 30% uh, of a vehicle's weight is dedicated to safety equipment. If you could make cars that are safe, we could uh, reduce the weight by 30% and as a result reduce the energy consumed in transportation by 30%, which translates to a 6% savings of the nation spent in this, in, in this nation, um, which is more than we can find in Alaska in offshore drilling. Okay? Uh, there's a huge opportunity here. Okay? We are irresponsible with our resources. Okay? Highways, for example, we decided to dedicate a huge fraction of our infrastructure, our space where we could live and do things, to things like parking lots and highways. Highways uh, are vastly underutilized. You might think that's not true. I'm stuck in traffic all the time, especially in Seattle, coming up on a cab. I was stuck in traffic for like half an hour. But the truth is, if you take a highway at peak capacity, when it works the best and has the highest throughput, and you measure, so you're driving about 50 miles per hour, and it's dense but not too dense, so there's still lots of cars coming through. And, and you take a, a, an image from the air, and in the image you count the number of pixels that are still visible, that's unoccupied highway, and relate them to the number of pixels that are occupied by cars, you find that only something like 8% of the surface is occupied by cars. And 92% of the space on a, on a busy highway at full capacity is free space. It's the space between us. Why? Well, by and large, we're lousy drivers. We are bad in keeping our car inside the lanes. We make them extra wide for us people. And we are bad about keeping a short distance with the car in front of us because we text all the time and, and do email. So as a result, we need certain distances to buffer us against our own failures. Okay? So we invented technologies that say, brought these cars a tiny bit more together and maybe made the highway 16% occupied, still 84% empty. Right? You've doubled the capacity of the US highway system. There's no invention that I can imagine that could resolve the current dilemma we have on highway systems. Every year we, we use our highway system 3% more due to population increase and us moving into more in the countryside. And there's no solution in sight. Moving vertical is actually uneconomical. Uh, a simple, tiny innovation could, could solve this problem. And speaking about uh, being uneconomical, the last common numbers I want to give you has to do with the number of cars. Pretty much every beer has a car, right? Is anybody without a car? Thank you. Oh, even some faculty. Great. Okay. Maybe 10% of you don't have a car because you live in Seattle. If you lived in Urbana, Champaign, <laughs> everyone would have a car or in Texas, El Paso, Texas. Um, and all your cars right now are not being used by anybody. How irresponsible of you <laughs> to waste these resources, right? So wouldn't it be great if you could share cars? Well, there's Zipcar, which is a nice concept, which works in cities very well because in a city you have the right ratio of, of car use and density of people. It doesn't work in, in vast parts of this country because we tend to settle out uh, into suburbia. Okay? Now, what if a car could drive itself? And I could take out my iPhone or my G phone, I should say, as a Googler, and, um, and punch in, uh, I need a car, and a minute later a car would pull up to me and I could use it. Right? Or I could send my own car back home to my wife after it sent me, to, uh, brought me to work, it could pick up my wife and, and, and she could use it. We, both of us could share a car, right? So with something like uh, what, 80 million cars or so in this country right now, a large number of cars, it's actually much more, it's 60 million new cars worldwide uh, and something over 200 million cars or so in this country. I forgot the exact number. Um, it's amazing that we end up using cars only about 3% of the time and 97% we don't use them, okay? Just imagine all the parking spaces, right? All the land spent on parking. Like everybody has a house, has a garage. You're wasting an entire bedroom just for your stupid car that you shouldn't park there. It should be used by somebody else, okay? And finally, um, time. Time matters. Time is the only thing that we really possess and control as people, okay? We spend, if you work on average, more than an hour per day, per working day, in commute traffic. That's time lost in my books. Um, so if you could somehow free up that time with new technology, we could make our work life more economical because we could start working an hour earlier or watch a video or, or write a couple of emails or, or read a newspaper. I guess we do emails anyhow in driving, but do this without, a, without the guilt of doing email, right? And, and, and the deaths. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to do something in the transportation sector that is very similar to what happened in the internet. It's not trivial. It takes a lot of work. There's enormous risks involved. I don't claim I can solve the problem right now. I wish I could. I think we need many, many people. We need not just engineers. We need policy makers, we need uh, business people, we need uh, lawyers to work together to understand all this. Uh, but it would be fantastic if in the United States we were to pick up these ideas and, and bring the company 
or the country back into the driver's seat of, of the automotive industry by really innovating and not lamenting about the automotive industry. So with this little introduction uh, and, and many big words, I want to tell you something about uh, what we've done at Stanford and in the community about self-driving cars. And no surprise, uh, this all started with DARPA, the entity that started the internet, I guess, research on, on the internet. And I got involved because DARPA issued what was called the Grand Challenge. Uh, you might have heard about it, it was a big car race, it was fairly well publicized. Um, um, so let me tell you the tale of the Grand Challenge, how I got drawn in and what happened. Okay, so I'm going to go back a couple of years. Um, the Grand Challenge was created by DARPA as a fairly bold step uh, to sidestep existing funding instruments that were used in the area of autonomous driving. Military had long recognized that autonomous driving could be useful in the battlefield, at least so it believed, and had spent, I, I did a uh, somewhat uh, incomplete collection of programs here, um, about half a billion dollars on research, which is substantial by computer science research standards, uh, over the years to build autonomous cars. And as late as 2001 or 2003 or 2004, when the, the final um, demo pr uh, program ended, uh, you could see demonstrations where this vehicle would go at 10 miles per hour for, not for 10 miles, but for 100 meters, run into a tree, and then some engineer would run with the woodworks and fix something and reset a computer and say, let's do it again, okay? So DARPA had this ingenious idea, instead of giving people money, lots of money, to develop this technology, why not like crank up the uh, performance metrics to driving uh, really fast without any human intervention over extended distances at the time believed to be impossible to do and give people no money, okay? <laughs> so maybe that works, right? We gave them money, didn't work, right? As a good social scientist, let's try something else, okay? So they created the DARPA challenge. Um, but they said, you know, if you can do it, you're going to get one million bucks. Not very much money by federal standards, but enough to uh, excite a lot of people thinking, wow, this could be a business plan. I have a car, I have a computer, let me tuck them together and win the Grand Challenge. Um, originally, the idea was to go from Los Angeles to Vegas um, and drive basically from Los Angeles to Vegas was the original theme. Uh, DARPA found out um, that the area in Los Angeles is populated, uh, so they moved it to Barstow. Um, <laughs> I hope there's no one from Barstow here. And instead of going to Vegas, they went to Prim, uh, Barstow is a fairly abysmal city. You've seen Kill Bill. One of the scenes with the snake bites is in Barstow. It's really, you don't want to live there. And Prim uh, is the first kind of casino behind the border to Nevada. So it collects all those, those gamblers who can't afford the, the gas to go all the way to, to Vegas. <laughs> so it's also fairly abysmal. Uh, the idea was to give people um, a, a data file of 2,700 GPS waypoints, like breadcrumbs, that would define a route through a fairly uh, complex and challenging desert terrain, desert trails, so to speak. It's not entirely off-road, it's really trail driving, uh, together with speed limits and the width of a corridor, and these cars had just to follow these GPS points, and they could do this for 142 miles. The winner who did it the fastest would get a million bucks. Okay, sounds easy, possibly too easy. So about 106 teams worldwide uh, registered, and you find a fairly strong correlation between the states that registered teams and the states that voted for Obama in the most recent election. It's completely <laughs> coincidental, okay? And I don't know what you're laughing about. This is kind of sad. Um, and here's video footage from the first such challenge. Um, there's a little bit of sound. This is Carnegie Mellon where I used to work. Um, as a, uh, Amador 2004, ladies and gentlemen. So, of these 106 teams, 15 were selected for the final competition. And most of them were universities, some of them were car nuts type people. And some of them took like existing vehicles like an SUV or a pickup truck like Team Dad here and modified into a robot by tapping into the electronics of the vehicle and putting a little motor on the steering wheel. Others built their own system. These guys hadn't debugged their controller. They actually flipped over just and the video ends, like right there. Okay, but DARPA cut it. Uh, the, the heaviest vehicle was Terramax, a 30,000-pound uh, vehicle. It's uh, used for the Marine Corps by a, a, a military provider. They had a, a slight backup problem. They backed up too much, more than they went forward. And the <laughs> smallest vehicle, I mean, if you look, come from the Bay Area, you know there's a competition between Stanford and Cal. Uh, Cal put an entry in a motorcycle. So here's Anthony Lewandowski from Cal running his entry. 
Um, Anthony, I actually talked to him afterwards. This is a little side note here and asked him, what's your goal for next year? And he said, uh, I'm going to double my performance. Um, <laughs> I gave you a good, if you're a shareholder, you, you smile. Um, then, anyhow, the, the, the race ended at mile seven. The, the furthest any vehicle got was seven miles. Uh, when the path uh, moved into a couple of switchbacks on the mountain, it was a perfectly drivable road, actually. Um, and all these vehicles, if you look very carefully at these burning vehicles, they all drove off the road. Like this is Carnegie Mellon on the left side next to a cliff, drove off the road and burned up a rubber tire. And all the vehicles basically couldn't find the road. So after 50 years of artificial intelligence research, we are obviously unable to find a road. And that's, for better or worse, the case um, to the present day. Now DARPA decided, let's do it again. And they doubled the price money. I couldn't tell whether it was a linear increase or exponential. Uh, my friend Rick, Ray Kurzweil said it's exponential, so just wait long enough and you can finance all the teams. Um, so I got involved uh, building a team at Stanford uh, to do the same thing. I just moved to Stanford and decided, look, I can do more than seven miles, okay? My problem was I had no funding. So I had to find a way to make this happen without funding. Now, if you're in a company and you have no funding, tough luck, right? You just do something else. In a university, however, right, there's a great business model, which is uh, you can either pay your staff for their work or you can give them course credit. So I created CS294, which is ongoing right now, Projects in Artificial Intelligence. Technically, the students paying tuition to me for teaching this class. <laughs> I had about 40 students show up. This is only about 20. These are the 20 that came to the second class. Uh, the, the first, you can argue which, which of the 40 were smarter, uh, but I, I think the smart ones actually stayed on. Um, they didn't leave. Uh, and I told them within a month, we should build a, uh, two months actually, sorry, until the end of the quarter, two months pretty much. Uh, we're going to build a car that drives one desert mile, completely autonomous. So we talked to Volkswagen. Volkswagen gave us some of the Touregs that don't sell so well uh, at the time. Um, they sell actually, wait, sorry, what's a joke? <laughs> Hi, Volkswagen. Um, <laughs> they're actually fantastic off-road vehicles. Um, and we put computers in the trunk, as shown over here. Uh, uh, Intel donated uh, a couple of blade computers, they're basically Pentium M type computers at the time, were relatively fast and rugged. And we uh, equipped the vehicle itself um, with a couple of buttons. This is the button that's my lifesaver. I'm alive because this button exists. Um, and, and it allowed me to switch from robotic control, where the vehicle was really controlling the steering wheel and everything, to human control. So I would sit there doing testing or someone, some student, and if the software was broken, hit the button fast enough to save our lives. More than once. Um, we also equipped the vehicle with all kinds of sensors. Sensors come in two groups. Uh, one pertains to uh, the vehicle's position, just finding out where you are on the course, essentially, and, and the motion of the vehicle, echo motion. Second part pertains to the environment. The ones that pertain to position are GPS and inertial measurement units. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail, but the field of avionics for the last 40 years has worked on very advanced uh, vehicle guidance systems that tell you where you are relative to a global GPS coordinate systems, how fast you're moving and which direction your vehicle is pitching and rolling and so on. And the second set of sensors pertains to environment perception. Um, with a, a GPS sensor alone, you can already replicate, and so did my students in the first week, the achievements of the first grand challenge by writing uh, controllers. Uh, here's a very simple steering controller that to the end we actually used. Just give you a flair for the type of software involved for control. If your grand challenge path is indicated as here and you wish to drive on it, one way to do this is to always put your front wheel parallel to the trajectory when you're on it, so you follow it. But as you get off it, add a, a corrective term that's proportional to the cross-track error to the steering. So you, you tend to steer back to the center trajectory. So it's called a P controller, very simple controller. That tends to work quite well. Um, you can refine it as a PID controller if you know about control theory. Um, with that specific controller, uh, about two weeks into the course, he went to Arizona and tested out following simple GPS waypoints. And you can see it drives quite nice. The steering wheel is fairly calm on a very wide road to accommodate the GPS area you might suffer as you, as you go with an actual vehicle and is able to follow this course relatively accurately. So that was about the state of the art for the 2004 Grand Challenge where the vehicles ended up driving off the road because of GPS error. Um, then we looked into the environment perception part. Uh, this is a laser. For those of you who haven't laser seen lasers before, this is manufactured by a German company. Dieter has plenty of those in his lab. Um, 
In a single slide, how they work, they point a light beam, an invisible laser light beam, onto a rotating mirror that diffracts the, uh, or reflects the laser into a planar uh, field. The laser light goes out, gets reflected at objects, the reflection gets back into the laser, and you can time the time it takes for this entire uh, path of the laser to the object and back. And from the timing, you can measure range, how far things are away. And you can do this with centimeter accuracy. It's quite amazing uh, using advanced uh, light technology. Um, with this, you have basically a single slicing uh, range finder in front of you, almost like a push broom, that you can push along as you drive through the environment and sense in 3D the, the ground structure of the, of the uh, surroundings. And if you find an obstacle like this vertical pole, some of the laser light will not move forward but move up, upwards. And by comparing and storing past laser points and doing a DZ comparison, you can detect vertical obstacles. So no specific deep science here. It gives you a feel for the type, very simple algorithms you might use to find obstacles. We uh, tried this a couple of weeks into the course. Uh, this is a, um, a very simple way to react to these obstacles, where we can draw internal paths, a very, very, very primitive planner, so to speak. Uh, look ahead as to what the steering effects are on the vehicle motion, and then select a path that avoids collision. We tried this early on with my students on the parking garage of the medical center at Stanford. This is a parking garage that's frequented and used heavily by medical staff and students. So for us to get space, we went around and told students what we're doing and said, look, we're driving an autonomous car. So as we moved on, fewer and fewer people chose to park there, and we could use more and more of the space, uh, as shown over here. Um, now, one month into the course, we did our final test, and as to be expected, the vehicle drove autonomously. It drove autonomously in a really, really bad way. We call this the drunk squirrel, even though it's a perfectly fine road. It oversteered, understeered, and here's me trying to hold the camera steady in my hand, barely able to do it at speed of maybe three miles per hour. We drove 8.5 miles at that day. This is past the point where Carnegie Mellon failed, so we'd love to show this at the time. It's exactly the point where they burned up their car. Um, but we kind of failed just behind the track <laughs> at much slower speed. So obviously, we've gone a long way to get something working, but we hadn't really solved the problem. And then a, a much longer phase started where we moved into trying to solve the problem uh, and really work out some of the kinks. Here's uh, some of the laser data visualized over time from a real course. You can see the complexity uh, of the point cloud. There's four different point clouds here for different lasers angled at different orientations down to the ground. Clearly the blue one is very short, like angled steeply down, whereas the, the red one points up. Um, so. Uh, here's an example of it going wrong. So we just see red means occupied, white means non-occupied. Some of the problems you run into when you make the system really uh, run over long term, that every single software bug, any conceptual error, at some point points up, turns up and kills you. So this, if there was a cliff on the right side, the car would have not go down and, and killed us. <laughs> this is actually not an obstacle, it's a perfectly fine um, region. Uh, so while the software worked beautifully for two or three miles at a time, it would never work for 10 miles at a time. And what we found out is that in our naivety of trying to uh, put together these laser data over time, we've completely forgotten about what we teach in our classes, which is probabilistic robotics that uh, um, Dita alluded to. Um, in probabilistic robotics, you really worry about uncertainty. So whereas before uh, I told you we just collect these data points, it turns out very small errors in your post estimation can have a devastating effect on your DZ detection. So for example, if you go forward, as shown in the next diagram, and your vehicle um, bobs down uh, and your scan line goes backward and then forward again, you might scan the same terrain twice and if you don't get your uh, pitch and roll estimates absolutely correct, you will end up with some very funny um, interpretations of the terrain. So here's an example of a bopping effect from actual data where a laser beam worked just fine. We have a very good pitch estimate. Here's one where the pitch estimate is actually a little bit worse and here's one where the pitch estimate hallucinates errors of magnitude of one meter or more. So we opened Dita's textbook, uh, of which I'm a co-author, and looked into probabilistic modeling, and out came that, um, I mean, there's different flavors of probabilistic modeling, that in our estimate of where we are, this is a, a typical common filter estimate of your pose at time t, t plus one, t plus two, uh, and your laser measurement at time t. When you compare laser measurements taken at different times, there's a possibility that the relative coordinate frames of these lasers are corrupted by error. So rather than having a deterministic triggering rule, we had to have a rule that, that considered this error. 
Uh, so we built a Markov random fields that basically analyzed how much error could have been accrued over here, over here, over here, over here, added all these errors up, and came up with an equation that was a probabilistic test. If you were confident with the high probability alpha that the vertical uh, shift was beyond a certain threshold, only then would we reject it. So these, these little tricks to, to understand the uncertainty of the system, even though it's not as grandiose as some of the work happening in probabilistic robotics, made a huge difference in our ability to drive reliable. And all of a sudden, let us go for 50 miles at a time or so. Second problem we ran into had to do with range. Let me just skip this. Um, if you look very carefully at the laser, um, your ability to find an obstacle at range is actually severely limited because you have to angle the laser down and the laser has limited reach. You can see about 22 meters. Okay, so just for you to know, if you can see 22 meters, don't go 50 miles an hour, okay? You can go about 20 miles per hour in a desert and still safely break when you see an obstacle, but you can't go 35 miles per hour, which we expected to drive in this, in this challenge. So we ask ourselves, how can we see further than, 35, uh, than, than 26 meters? And the answer was obvious, right? So people do it all the time, right? We're using cameras, uh, computer vision, right? We use eyesight, you can perfectly see the vote here. So why not uh, endow the robot with a computer vision routine that would be able to process the incoming video and find the road? Okay. Obviously, after 50 years of, or 30 years of computer vision research, there's got to be a paper on how to find a road. Right? If, we, if you don't have that paper, then what have you achieved? <laughs> okay. So it turns out there's no such paper. In fact, I, I let my students do this, and they came up with a couple of ideas, partially motivated by existing literature. One was color-based, right? So clearly the road is gray. But sometimes the road is overgrown with grass and it turns green. Sometimes it's a paved road, it's dark, so there's no reliable color. And sometimes the sun is so deep that it blinds your imager and all of a sudden it affects the entire image distribution, color distribution in your image, so there's no reliable color. It doesn't work. Okay. Second idea was smoothness. So clearly, if you look at image smoothness, which has to do with the difference of appearance of two adjacent pixels in the image, in the road, because it's meant to drive, it's going to be very smooth, right? And if, if you go to the vegetation on the side, it's very unsmooth, right? You find a lot of transition from like dark to bright. It turns out the smoothest part of the image is the sky. So you're going to make a wonderful sky driving system. <laughs> um, after iterating this with the course and not solving it, we eventually found a solution which goes back to the early 90s by Dean Pomelo, but redeveloped by us, I guess, uh, whereby we we, we phrased uh, computer vision as an adaptive and, and, and ever adapting problem where we have to adapt to the environment continuously. Just the way I conjecture, people adjust their visual ability to the environment all the time, right? So you can go outside and I wear the same shirt. I guess it doesn't have any really color, but take a colored shirt like this red shirt over here. It'll be appear differently outside by different lighting, but you have no difficulty adjusting your eyesight to accommodate these changes. Now, if you want to adapt to the vote color, which we don't know, where on earth do we get our training data? Well, and here lies the uh, trick that we played in adaptive vision. We said, well, we have a, a, a sensor called a laser that can find us flat surfaces just too late at too short a range. However, we can map the laser readings into the visual image, extract a region that's drivable, and then learn a classifier 10 times a second that finds more of the same. So here you find, it's almost like a Photoshop flood fill if you think about this. Uh, here you find um, a classifier that's being trained on the area patched just before the robot, where it's way too late to react to it, but applying the same classifier further in the image. It's a mixture of Gaussian classifier using texture and uh, uh, color uh, distributions as input. Um, so here's the same classifier applied to an actual desert stretch, and uh, it's not perfect. So there's places outside the road that look road-like, they have the same color and texture distribution, like the berm, for example. Um, but by and large, it's actually um, quite reliable. We use this as, an, uh, as a system to gate speed. So if the vision system would say, I can see a road far to the horizon, maybe 40 meters out, um, we, we, we estimated, he's making a planar, planar ground assumption, somewhat approximate. But if you could see roads 40 meters out, we would say, let's go high speed. And if the computer vision system wouldn't confirm the existence of road, we'd just slow down so the lasers would catch us in case there was something in the way. Um, then speed. Speed was a really important issue. Uh, at some level, you want to go really fast, right? And at some other level, you want, didn't want to go too fast. See, after all, you're in the desert, and there were plenty of places where the speed limit was 50 miles per hour, where you would wreck the car if you went 50 miles per hour. Like, this is not exactly from the original course, but it gives you kind of a feel for the type of terrain you might actually encounter. This is uh, one of the testing grounds where Volkswagen tests its products, like the Touareg. Uh, so it's fairly substantial. 
So it's about the max speed you can go there without killing yourself. Uh, so we had to think about speed. And just encouraged by machine learning, here's just one slide on it, we decided to copy a human driver's speed. So we set up a controller that had two properties. Uh, in the absence of any kind of incident, incident was a, a vertical shock or uh, a, a steep slope or a narrow passage, it would gradually get closer, faster and faster until it hit a bump and then would compute a maximum z acceleration for the bump and then uh, slow down to the point that this specific z acceleration that your vehicle, your shock that vehicle received would not surpass a certain threshold. So it's occasionally it would, it would bump and then like a chicken slow down. You can see this and then gradually the speed would creep up. And to learn the parameters of this controller, which is a very simple controller, we actually had a human drive it. It's shown in yellow. The green stuff is the speed limit. Um, and the vehicle tried to find the parameters that best matched human driving performance. Okay? So first we started with my postdoc, Mike Montemello, and we got a very slow vehicle because he's an American careful driver. And then I took over and said, I'm German, I can drive faster. And eventually we drove the German profile, which is reckless, but we won the challenge, so <laughs> no complaints. But you can see regions where the speed limit is substantial, and even a human driver like me would not drive faster than 25 miles per hour, as shown over here. Uh, our competitors, Carnegie Mellon in this case, had a far different approach. They actually manually labeled in the two hours before the race, when they were given the data, we gave them data for two hours before the race, uh, manually labeled with about 20 people the train uh, meticulously every inch and look, using aerial imagery, using uh, 3D LiDAR scans, using stuff they get from aircraft so that they could get perfect uh, speed. Um, this has a little bit of sound, but not much. Um, they would get perfect speed settings for different train areas. So every time they saw a rut in the area image, they would slow down the vehicle manually and it would drive in a pre-programmed way. We couldn't afford all these people, so we ended up with a small little controller. Um, race itself, uh, let me talk about other teams. Before we, um, the race came days before, I spent all my time in the Mojave Desert uh, and later the Sonoran Desert, uh, disrupted only by brief trips home so my wife didn't divorce me and then back to the desert. And we had a vehicle that was fairly competent to drive um, could drive about 40 miles per hour, 38 miles per hour. Um, on flat desert road would go relatively fast. Um, it would be able to drive through obstacles like, uh, this, I think is a sand bed coming up, a, a dry river bed over here. It would then slow down automatically by itself and it was able to avoid basic obstacles. We're gonna see next is a fairly steep descent. There's an obstacle, a little bush. Um, our vehicle would drive around it, not very elegantly, but very effectively. So it was by far, the most environmentally friendly vehicle I've sat in in a long time, saving every bush. It also, also swerved around la large, large um, insects or uh, birds and so on, which was a, a time a nuisance. Um, you weren't the only ones. Um, there was a lot of competition. And just to give you a flavor of the competition at the time, I'm going to highlight three teams here, um, or four teams. Uh, one was Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon, uh, clearly a strong team. There was actually from 106 team in 2005, we went to 195 teams. So you're Chances of winning were like half a percent. Um, so one was the CMU team, as shown over here. They had a, a two Hummers. They, they found a loophole in the rules to, to, to deploy two vehicles, which make it double their chances. Um, they were rumored to drive uh, 50 miles per hour. They're actually driving faster than us. And they were the first ever to hit a 200 mile run in, in this kind of terrain, before, long before we did. Um, but these weren't the only ones. So here's another team. Um, so some teams were like universities, okay? Like serious places like Carnegie Mellon and later on MIT and us and, and so on. Some of them were uh, companies like defense contractors, right? And some of them were just car nuts. Uh, people who uh, either uh, said, okay, I'm gonna put a, um, a computer and a, and a car together and they're gonna drive themselves and the software doesn't really matter. Or people who had the specific thing, like the next guys have a uh, tracked vehicle. Right, so tough guys, uh, great vehicle actually but not suited for the challenge because software wasn't an issue here. So when it comes to fast acceleration, they were clearly the best. But when it came to smarts, um, they were also able to, to, to go through water and all kinds of stuff. Um, but they, they didn't make it, so when it came to software, there wasn't much intelligence. Um, the next one um, was the worst watched video ever. Okay, and we have to have sound here, and please crank it up. This is, this is uh, a DARPA site visit video for Axion Racing's entry into the 2005 DARPA Grand Challenge. We want to thank the United States government, DARPA, its director, Dr. Tony Teller. Hi, Tony. Okay. Thank you. So, this is a DARPA site visit video. Okay. Um, and then 
My friends from UC Berkeley had a motorcycle and they bravely taped every single crash. It turns out running motorcycles is much harder than running a car. Okay, so if you're in a car and you want to tow, you just drag your steering wheel around it, it's fine. In a motorcycle, if you do this, you fall. So what you have to do is you basically have to basically let your fall to one side by, by, by the steering to the opposite side and then catch your own fall. It's a fairly complicated routine. So he ended up using reinforcement learning a la um, Drew Bagnell and Ring to make it work. And actually it worked really nicely, as you shall see later. Uh, my favorite uh, crash, however, is the one when the New York Times visited him uh, on the same day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And pardon? Okay, so if the question that the year <laughs> they were comes up putting again, a new computer and the thing was running four hours later. It's quite impressive. We also had our moments of despair. This is in the desert after a big rainstorm, and at some point the water gets so thick we can't see anything. These are the moments where our lives are in the of our software. Uh, it's a great way to write software. Um, not a great way to live long, however, uh, as shown over here. Um, just to move on uh, with the first competition. Um, the first competition, here's my team, um, took uh, place uh, first in a little artificial desert environment that was 2.2 meters long in Fontana, California. Uh, here our car is completely driverless. Behind it is a chase vehicle by the organizers that have a radio e-stop in case something goes wrong. Of course, when things go wrong, typically a computer crash and e-stop doesn't work anymore, but they didn't really care about this. Um, you can see it uh, on an artificial course that's about 2.2 miles long, uh, encountering all kinds of obstacles, like here, passing another vehicle, like maybe an abandoned robot. So you should show that you're safe to do this. This is a high-speed section over here. We're going about 38 miles per hour uh, with a full capability to, to stop and, and drive around obstacles using computer vision, all the stuff I showed you before. And the hardest obstacle was a tunnel. Uh, th three places, the course went under a highway. You couldn't really cross the highways. There was kind of little support tunnels under highways. This is a very short section and cross section uh, of a tunnel under I-15. Uh, there was, of course, much longer. And the problem with tunnels is that you lose GPS reception. So you have a harder time orienting yourself when you're being GPS denied. And it's also hard to reorient yourself when you emerge from the tunnel and you find you're somewhere else. And just to give you more feeling how, how hard this entire thing is, among the semi-finalists, here's pictures other vehicles at Nova taped that made a beautiful movie here. Okay, so you see a vehicle uh, dugging itself in. Um, got actually stuck. It's really hard to get stuck with a vehicle of this type. Um, you find um, Anthony Lewandowski's motorcycle had solved the control problem and not the perception problem. <laughs> um, but in anticipation of not having solved the perception problem, Anthony invented uh, little kickstands that automatically <laughs> would deploy and upright the motorcycle. So, <laughs> as, so these guys had a little software bug that whenever they got a GPS denied environment in the tunnel, they accelerate as fast as possible <laughs> to regain <laughs> GPS. This was the only time we had to get an ambulance. Um, Carnegie Mellon, by and large, did, did great. And of course, um, at the time, because I just left Carnegie Mellon, it was a pleasure for me to include videos of Carnegie Mellon doing something bad. Here they had a calibration error. They argued a Hummer can take hay bales. DARPA said, okay, still get a penalty point. Sorry, Red. Um, and then there was a huge number of vehicles that just wouldn't get it. Like, this is after a lot of work. Um, the vehicle here, they would just run into random obstacles at the very first gate as if they are seeking them out. Uh, this <laughs> doom mating behavior, what have you. Um, Let's see, the next guy's um, with a huge sensor array coming up. No, stuck in the tunnel. All kinds of stuff. <laughs> Let me just move up. Um, the race itself uh, was, of course, for me, a, a moment I will never forget. Uh, we were there. And like in most races, when you train up for the race, the race itself is the moment when you burn the most calories. I can attest we burned a lot of calories that day, but not because we did anything of use. Um, we ended up in a big tent watching our robot start. Um, and drinking champagne, and eating breakfast, and chatting with the media, and so on. Carnegie Mellon got first pole position, first and third. Stanley, after a little glitch in the beginning, uh, due to a GPS shift, uh, moved out. And the feelings of seeing this happening were quite overwhelming. Um, after working for more than a year on this car, every single day, seeing it go by itself and disappear in the desert was quite a moment. Uh, it's hard to compare with anything else. Uh, for those of you who have kids that are old enough to have gone to college, 
You might compare it to sending your kid to college. You worked on them for 18 years, day in, day out, taught them everything you know, and now they have to come back themselves from the desert or the college without any scratches, <laughs> dents, or whatever you care about, not pregnant, whatever you care about uh, in your performance metrics, okay? Um, big moment for us. Uh, all these cars are, are empty and, and just followed by DARPA chase vehicles. So you can see a helicopter recording of our steering wheel here. Um, the race itself, uh, we could follow it uh, just on a website. Um, these images were all taken by a, a news helicopter or by a Nova helicopter uh, during the race. The website, as you see here, in fast forward, showed the relatively complex path that's about 131 miles long. It overlaps itself at multiple times. And these dots in fast forward are running robots. Green means running and red means deceased. Here's the uh, deceasing of the Caltech robot that misunderstood one of the GPS coordinates and insisted on it being right, but it wasn't. <laughs> these guys got stuck behind a rock the race before, so this time when they drove off the course, because the sensor came loose, they gave full throttle. These guys lost a laptop. Unfortunately, the laptop was running all of collision avoidance. It wasn't a good idea, so eventually got stuck. Carnegie Mellon, our big competitor, their lead vehicle, had an engine problem, and the engine shut down. Uh, it, it actually rolled back and then restarted itself, and then uh, we drove, but at a slower pace, and that gave us, this little incident gave us a chance to get the leading edge. So you can see us pursuing Carnegie Mellon at short range, where the distance and starting time was five minutes apart, so we should have been much further away. This is a, obviously a time race. Uh, at mile 102, we were finally afforded an opportunity to pass Carnegie Mellon. For that purpose, Carnegie Mellon's vehicle was paused. The time didn't count against Carnegie Mellon, but in a symbolic moment, we were able, this is all video footage recorded on video and, and just uh, uploaded later. Uh, we were able to um, circumnavigate for the first time ever in a race a man-made obstacle, a hammer by Carnegie Mellon, and take now formally the lead in the race by being the first vehicle. The, uh, that was just ahead of the final obstacle, which was a very treacherous mountain pass shown here. It's about a couple of miles long, called Beer Bottle Pass. Um, this is stuff that is drivable for people, but takes, uh, takes some focus to drive because on the left you have a fairly deep cliff. On the right side you have a mountain that you wouldn't want to run into. And um, we, we did well. Uh, we could see this, um, this specific scene actually in the tent because DARPA had positioned uh, a cameraman on the course to show this to us. What we saw is that the entire vehicle was covered in dust. And the effect it has, it sees less obstacles, but for whatever reason it worked anyhow. Uh, so we just saw maybe 10 meters of range as opposed to 20 meters of range. When this all uh, was over, um, we knew that there was a chance that we actually finish. So we all went outside. It took about an hour for the vehicle to the last couple of miles, uh, last 30 miles or so. First we saw uh, helicopters at a range, then we saw a dust cloud, finally a, a blue dot. And then the, the unimaginable happened. We, we actually saw our car coming back after 131 miles, the first ever to finish a race of this magnitude. It was a big moment for us. Um, later on, Carnegie Mellon's two vehicles came back. You can see our, our team celebrating. Now, um, we got the money. My dean got the money, okay? To the present day, I, my dean got the money. Um, DARPA actually announced an, a new race that just took place in 2007, about a year ago, called the DARPA Urban Challenge. And the idea was to uh, to take what's best about autonomous driving and make it a little bit more realistic than the desert challenge. So you might critique the desert challenge for being in a static environment without other traffic. And one of the biggest missing things was it wasn't really urban the way most of us drive. So DARPA came up with a challenge called the Urban Challenge uh, as a successor race where we came in second after Carnegie Mellon, um, rightfully, I think. Um, and the Urban Challenge basically involved vehicles kind of delivering FedEx packages, okay, here and there, okay. So the Urban Challenge, uh, our depiction of it looked like this. Um, that's what we expected to happen. Um, so I'm going to give, go very quickly to some of the technology in the Urban Challenge, just to show you one scene of the Urban Challenge. This is the uh, prelims running up to the Urban Challenge. This is a merging scene where a robot has to do a left turn onto a very narrow 12-foot lane through traffic. There's 11 cars driving around. So it has to be able to see these other vehicles wait for them, obey the traffic laws, is clearly the last one to go, find the gap that's just big enough, there isn't many gaps that are big enough, get into the lane without uh, faltering, and drive along the lane right next to this concrete barrier. Uh, the precision that we require here for executing this is, is much more than GPS provides. So you have to be able to perceive the environment, the lane markers and so on, and you have to be able to understand whether other cars are driving in your lane or in the opposite lane. So it's, it requires a lot of precision in doing this. And we had to do this loop a couple of times, about 11 times or so. So you find the same 
uh, task on the other end when you uh, turn back into the little stub road where you drive left across traffic. So here you can see Junior, as the name is now, uh, waiting for oncoming traffic and then eventually uh, taking its left turn. Um, to do this, uh, we have now new sensor technology. Now we had a lot of money, so we could actually build better sensors. We had also lots of sponsors, corporate sponsors that helped, plenty of them. Uh, the sensors, uh, the most important one is a laser sensor that has a rotating laser that uh, 10 times a second scans your environment with 64 different scan lines at different angles. So it's like a, a laser on steroids. Um, and the laser allows you to build fairly elaborate environment maps, uh, find obstacles as small as small curbs using some machine learning technology to detect those, also big obstacles and also classify underpasses using other machine learning technology that Dirk Hanel built, one of Adidas' former postdocs. Um, uh, we, we are able to, to use this data to do tracking of other vehicles. So what's shown here is our car driving down a street and on the top left side you see the internal model of other vehicles. This is using particle filters as a probabilistic technique for tracking where the unknowns are, where the other vehicles, and what size are there. So it's a high dimensional particle filter or medium dimensional particle filter. And um, a lot of work went into decision making and planning. Just give you some snapshots of decision making. One had to do with discrete decisions such as lane passing. Um, so you can you see a lane shift over here being planned by our blue vehicle, driving around the red vehicle. Um, we made fairly complicated situations where there would be an abandoned car on the left side. When I looked at this, uh, Mike Montemello had programmed this with his typical American understanding of safety, I told him our car would clearly be able to squeeze through. <laughs> well, in my best German accent, this is possible, okay? So I forced Mike to change the parameters to make it fit. Here we go. Okay, clearly there's plenty of space, right? Obviously, right? <laughs> of course there's empty space, right? So, um, <laughs> And then, uh, thank you, another German. Um, finally, somebody appreciates ag aggressive driving. Um, and then we had to deal with these kind of rare cases where, for example, there could be a collision in the center of an, of an uh, uh, intersection. There's no way around it to drive it around illegally. So we had to build a whole hierarchy of behaviors that would eventually immerse in more and more animalistic driving and, and fewer and fewer rules being obeyed in this driving mode. So this one, after waiting for a couple of seconds, realizing that the road is blocked, would then uh, invoke a general purpose planner to find a path, no matter where this path went, and no matter what other cars were there, to just drive there. That's the way we drive in Germany, it turns out, even more so in Italy. Um, so these are general purpose, A star based uh, generalizations of path planning, continuous spaces of the type you find a lot in the literature right now. So here's see a typical vehicle executing one of these continuous paths, running into some sort of an impasse, and being able to then replan dynamically. Um, so just a few images from the actual Urban Challenge. The Urban Challenge had um, about 90 com competitors, of which about 40 were admitted to the semifinals and about, I think, 13 or so made it to the race. Um, here's the beginning of it. You see our car driverless uh, driving around uh, through a network of streets that is carefully manicured and is only inhabited by other robots, about about 15 or so other robots and human-driven cars. There were stunt drivers in these other cars and they had roll cages and so on uh, so that they could uh, not be heard in the case of a collision. Uh, parking maneuvers and so on. Um, just to show you some of the animations, um, let me skip this one, go to the next one. This is a, um, a typical animation of a merge. In this specific instance, there's a robot coming from the right side. You can see it over there. It's running into our lane. This is a little bit risky from the robot's perspective our robot automatically slows down um, and the chase vehicle is now on the right side and it's going to be uh, lining up behind us. This is how the laser data looks during the race. And the next one just shows you a parking animation of the many, many things that happened during this urban challenge. Overall, the urban challenge did have accidents, several. Uh, one car-to-car -car collision, or it's two car-to-car -car collision, both times involving MIT. MIT had a, uh, a strange thing that, that didn't cause these accidents, but everybody bumped into MIT for strange reasons. I don't understand why. Um, and there was also cars driving off the road. A German team drove off the road. Here you see a parking maneuver. Parking was kind of funny. There were no, no other cars around, but he had designated parking spots. And then he had to back out um, backwards from this parking spot as shown over here. This is all data from the race itself. And here is a typical scene from the race, um, which shows, I think, the first ever robotic traffic jam. 
Um, if you look at this, there's, this is actually taken from an actual screen inside the tent where we can look at the situation from a, from a helicopter. You can find actual robots as indicated over here, four of them in total. And you find human drivers, these are the chase vehicles or the stunt drivers, sitting there. And this DARPA had to call it shut at this moment to sort out who can drive next. This is probably historically the first uh, robotic traffic jam. Okay? Now you might say it's a bad thing to have a robotic traffic jam. On the same day in California, on Route 99, on the same morning, the following picture was taken. I kid you not, on the same day, a mass accident involving more than 100 vehicles causing two deaths occurred on Highway 99 in California. This is showing you in contrast that this specific robot race was really safe compared to human driving. So when you were trying to solve the problem of road detection and you said you had a laser that was pointing down so you <coughs> why couldn't you just install an old laser that would be not tilting downwards as much so we'd be able to see further? So um, the question is how if you do road detection and you have a laser pointed downwards, don't I have a second laser that, that looks a little bit further up? If you actually tried that, at some point we put two lasers on top of each other. And what we found is that the calibration of these lasers to each other was, was very sensitive. And the slightest modification of the way the lasers were mounted ended up introducing systematic error that would render the vehicle from that point completely unusable. Uh, so in some extent, if we go to the urban challenge where we have these 64 scan lines, there's just like 64 lasers mounted on top of each other. But they were mounted in a way that were built uh, into a single assembly and they happened to stay calibrated. And this was the first time we could actually do this. But in principle, yes, I agree. Having multiple lasers at multiple angles is the way to go. We just couldn't afford a system at the time for the first race. So, so this approach, or what you've shown here, is using mostly um, completely autonomous aside from your GPS assist, or the GPS information. Um, I've seen uh, things talking about if you start instrumenting other cars, they can talk to each other and say, oh, I'm here, I'm here. Let's all get into a train or whatever. What's your opinion? I mean, clearly making both is the best, or what's your opinion on how to go forward with those two? Yes, yeah, so the question pertains to the ability of cars to talk to each other as a way to avoid collisions. Uh, there's actually a dedicated program, it's been going for many years now, a dedicated short-range communication program that works like Wi-Fi between cars. And the US and now other countries as well, Japan and Europe, have reserved frequency bands specifically for the purpose that cars form ad hoc networks and talk to each other. Uh, so that you could, for example, warn each other if there's, for example, fog, you could see these cars in advance, okay? This specific picture is taken, uh, occurred during fog, it was taken when the fog was gone, okay? Fog has this very unpleasing uh, pleasing side uh, effect that we drive closer together because you want to see the guy in front of us, it turns out. Um, so a system like this could certainly save lives. Um, the, the idea of dedicated short-range communication is generally a very, very good idea. So being able to inform yourself whether at an intersection another vehicle is approaching or whether you can talk to the traffic light and understand that you're just about to run a red light is a good idea, can save lives just like seat belts. Okay? Practically, it's going to take a while. It turns out we are stuck in discussions about standards, uh, experiments. Uh, the case hasn't been fully made, uh, and there's just too many agencies involved right now at this point to be effective in moving forward. In a way, all the different car companies would have to agree on a standard, right? and everybody would like to own the standard. So simple business considerations are some, somewhat in the way of, of making this a reality. But I think sometime from now, maybe 10 years from now, so we're going to all have cars talk to each other. And I think it's going to be, we're going to be better off. We're going to have few deaths on accidents. Uh, DARPA doesn't have any, other, any challenges planned, as I understand it. Is there, what's the next step for all of this? I think the next step for us is to step up and solve the problem technically. I think we're still way away from uh, being able to do this. If you look at the reliability and the urban challenge, you could say, you could argue you can drive 100 miles without accident. People can drive 10 to the 5 times as far without accident. So there's a huge gap in reliability uh, between humans and, and machines right now. Um, we should work with policymakers to understand what, how to change society, certain regulations to make this technology possible, right? And we should build up new markets where people use this technology. I have no doubt when it works, and it happens at some point, uh, it'll be greatly welcomed by people because it'll free us of the need to drive. We can just sit down and do something else. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. If you ever sat in an autonomous car, most of you haven't. I have. Uh, it's actually a liberating feeling to understand. You have like a train situation, right? Um, so I think for us as computer scientists or engineers, uh, we should really just focus our resources on this and really work on this and solve the problem. Or if it's not solvable, 
work as hard as you can and then conclude it's not solvable. But I think it's solvable. Um, there's no more races, unfortunately, so no more two million bucks <laughs> at this point. But DARPA, I mean, DARPA sees itself as seed starting it. And they've certainly started a field of people that are involved right now and, and understand the vision behind it. Um, I think we, should, we need more people than anything at all. This is a great challenge. It's a fantastic robotic challenge. And I mean, I've done a lot of projects over my lifetime, like putting robots in the nursing homes and so on into museums. This is the only one with a straight face I can really argue this is going to be massive for society. It's going to be game-changing for society.